Thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Will Greenberg. I'm with the Development and Communications team at Brooklyn Legal Services Corporation A, or Brooklyn A for short. Uh, and thank you so much for joining us for uh, this tax tips workshop. Uh, we'll be covering a variety of different helpful tax uh, uh, topics uh, that'll keep you uh, up to date on everything you need for taxes uh, all year round. So a little bit about uh, Brooklyn A, uh, if you are new to us or maybe uh, a longtime friend or partner, uh, we were founded more than 50 years ago, and we serve clients throughout all five New York City boroughs from our home offices based in Williamsburg and Bed-Stuy. We provide innovative, collaborative, neighborhood-based representation and advocacy that advances social and economic justice and opportunity. The core theme of our high-quality, low-barrier legal services is to support individuals, families, and small businesses so that they can thrive and stay rooted in their communities and neighborhoods despite the pressures of gentrification and displacement. We have uh, three core program areas here at Brooklyn A, uh, our Preserving Affordable Housing Program, uh, which does eviction prevention work, anti-harassment work, repair and essential services, uh, and tenant organizing. Uh, we have our Community and Economic Development Program, which works uh, with small businesses on commercial lease assistance small, uh, and also for nonprofits. Uh, same services for negotiating rent and arrears, nonprofit uh, and incorporation, uh, and startup services. And then we have the Consumer and Economic Advocacy Program, where uh, tonight's uh, uh, program comes from. Uh, this is uh, one of the widest program, the widest program in terms of the different things they do. Uh, it includes our low income taxpayer clinic, which offers a variety of different tax resources. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, we have our foreclosure prevention program, uh, which does deed theft cases and predatory lending. And uh, in the last year, Brooklyn A also asked, added our domestic violence program, which offers uh, services, including orders of protection, child custody support, and more. Uh, so tonight, to go to the next slide. Thank you. We wanna thank uh, uh, our sponsors, uh, State Senator Roxanne Prasad and Council Member Marjorie Velasquez. Uh, uh, thanks them very much uh, for sponsoring and being uh, ongoing partners of, of Brooklyn A's work. Uh, and serving uh, the New York community. Uh, we uh, might get a chance to, to hear from uh, Council Member Velasquez. I know everybody's got busy schedules uh, right now. So uh, we, we may have her join the call at some point, but uh, for now, I think we'll just say thank you to them. Uh, and then we will move into our program. Um, I want to uh, just briefly introduce uh, our three speakers for tonight. Uh, uh, they are actually uh, interns at Brooklyn A. Uh, and they've been uh, doing excellent work this summer. Uh, the first speaker you'll be hearing from uh, is CJ Trey, who is going to, into his third year at Hofstra. Then we'll have uh, James uh, Macaluso, uh, who is going to his second year at Brooklyn Law School, uh, and Evan Sponder, who is also going into his second year at Brooklyn Law School. And with that, I will turn things over to CJ. Thank you, Will. And then at the very beginning, I wanna thank BKA and all of our sponsors for sponsoring this event. So we can have this opportunity to give back to this community in our own way. So for today's agenda, there's a three big parts of this presentation. The very first part is tips for filing. Um, this is for all the tips when you file your tax return. And then taxpayers bill of rights is what kind of rights you have as a taxpayer. And then the third is collection. It's about what you do when you own the money to IRS or New York State. Next, next slide, thank you. Sorry, I should, sorry, CJ, I hate to cut you off. I forgot to mention, we, I'll, I'll just say too, we will have a um, Q and A at the end. So if folks have questions throughout, um, please just hold them for the end and we will either, um, you can actually throughout the, uh, the presentation, if you wanna put them into the chat, type them uh, at the bottom of your screen, you can do that. Um, and if you want to ask them verbally, you can raise your hand and we can unmute you, but we'll do that at the end. Sorry, CJ, <laughs> go ahead. Thank you. So for the first part, tips for filing, there's a small three parts. The first one is tax documents. And then the second part is refundable credits. And then the third part is self-employment obligations. Next, thank you. Before we start the tax documents, I want to introduce this website, Vita website. This is Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program. So this, is, this website is for people who generally make 60K or less, or people with disabilities, or, lim or people with limited English speaking uh, skills. So this website is really easy to use. You can just click on the link 
and then you can just simply put a zip code down to zip code down to the website and then you can find the most close site to you on this website it will show the providers distance language dates hours appointments whether you need appointments or not um, but since covid there's a lot of sites they change to online filing only so before you showed up you might want to call them to make sure do you need appointment or what kind of documents you need to bring just be safe next slide please thank you so this part i want to talk about all kinds of tax documents um very first if you are working for someone or some company you should receive the w-2 from your employer, um, you should receive before January, uh, January 31st. If you don't, you just simply contact your HR or employer to get the form. And then the second category, it's a self-employed people. If you work as a freelancer, you probably will get all kinds of 1099s. There are two very common 1099s, 1099 NEC, it's for cash workers, and then 1099 K. So at the moment, uh, K is for uh, reportable transactions. So at right now, the third party settlement organization who issued those 1099K payment card or third party companies, they're required to report to IRS any transactions, gross payment exceeded 20K uh, a year, and then there's more than 200 transactions. So in other words, you if you receive more than $20,000 and more than 200 times transactions, you need to re the third party will report to the IRS. So you just wanna make sure you also report them uh, on your tax return. And then the third part, it's the third point is employee. If you receive employment, you will receive 1099G from New York State uh, Department of Labor. If you are a student, you will receive 1098T and E. Uh, T is for tuition statement, and an E is for student loan interest statement. You should get those documents from your school. For homeowners, there's a mortgage statement. And then the last point is retirees. So in this category, there are two forms, SSA 1099 and 1099R. So for a lot of retired people, they think when they retired, they don't need to file, they don't need to report this anymore. But it really depends on how much money you received combined for the whole tax year. Um, so this is really case by case situation. Uh, for example, if you sold any stocks or any bond, or you withdraw any cash from your retirement account. So if you ask for someone to prepare this for you, uh, you want to make sure you call them first and then make sure what kind of documents you, you need to bring. So sum up, if you're going to go to no matter accountant or free clinic, you just bring all the documents. It's always better to have more than less. Uh, next slide, please. The last thing I want to introduce because when you file your tax return electronically, no matter the platform, they will ask you to submit a last year's uh, tax return. For some reason, if you don't have it anymore, you can go on this IRS website to get your tax uh, transcript. Um, but IRS wanna make sure this process is super secured. So they will ask a lot of information like email, phone number, photo ID, face scan to set up. So just prepare, they're gonna ask a lot of questions. And next, next slide, please. So the next part I wanna talk about refundable credits. For this part, I'm gonna focus on two credits, earned income tax credits and then child tax credit. So earned income tax credits is, is for certain qualifying taxpayers who works and also earn a gross income less than amount of money. If you're married and then you file jointly, that will be $59,187. And if you're a single, that'll be $53,057. 
So at the very beginning, I want to give some definitions. What is earned income? The earned income is all kinds of income from your employment. If you're working for someone, wages, salaries, tips, bonuses, or if you are self-employed, that means your net earning. Then what is not considered as an income from IRS point of view? Pensions, annuities, welfare benefits, you can see on the list. So those things are not considered as an income from the government point of view. Next slide, please. There are seven requirements for taxpayer to claim this tax credit. So at a very first one, as I mentioned, you have to make uh, less amount of money. If you are married file jointly, that's almost 60K. If you are single, that's 53K. Uh, and then second, you must have a valid social security number by the due date. And then you must meet certain requirements if you're separated from your spouse and not filing jointly. So in this situation, you have to live apart from your spouse at least six months of the whole tax year. And then, or you are legally separated according to the state law. Either you have a, a separation agreement or you didn't live in the same apartment for at least six months. So in this situation, if you're married but not filing jointly, and then you also have a qualifying child who lived with you, that must be more than six months. And the fourth one is you must be a US citizen or resident aliens for the entire tax year. Fifth, you cannot file this form 2555. This is related to foreign earned income. So if you have foreign earned income, IRS require you to report those things, and then you are not qualified for claim this credits. And then six, investment amount must be lower than $10,300. And then seven is for public policy uh, consideration. You must earn some type of income. US government don't want you just claim the credits and then not working. Next slide, please. So there's a, if you don't have a qualifying children for claim this tax credits, you must be aged between 25 to 65 by the end of the tax year. And then you can see on the, on the slides at the very last, the maximum amount for, of credits. If you don't have qualifying children, that'll be $600. If you have one qualifying child, that suddenly jumped to 4,000. If you have a two children, qualifying children, that's gonna be $6,600. If you have three or more, that will be almost $7,500. Next slide, please. So the potential on effect on the welfare benefits, the good news, there's none. So if you receive those temporary assistance for needy family, Medicaid, or food stamp or low income, in uh, low income housing, there's nothing to worry about. You still can claim those benefits. Um, in other words, IRS doesn't see those things as your income. Next slides, please. The next part I wanna talk about the child's tax credit. Um, there are some similarities between two credits I'm talking about for tonight. Um, there are both refundable. Refundable means if it's bring your taxable income down to zero, the government will give you the cash back. Um, and then they're both increased with the number of children you have. And then they're both, uh, they're both benefits low income housing of families. And then also this is also earn, earning based. So it's not available if you're not making any income. So the difference between those credits, the child tax credits also benefits middle class families. So if you are married and filing jointly, if two parents, they make less than 400K, they're still qualifying. If you are single, that means 200K. You have to make 200K or less. Um, and then taxpayer receive maximum credits for each qualifying children. And then qualifying children's age, it's 17 years old or below for child tax credits, 19 and below for EITC, 
but if you have a, a child still a full-time student that's extend to 24 years old next slide please and then as i said you must earn some type of income so the minimum income you have to make is $2,500 per year. And then for refundable up to $2,000 per qualifying child. Uh, and then you must, as a parent, you must have a TAN number by the due date. This is for the situation when you don't have a social security number. And then each qualifying child must have a social security number um, while, while, uh, when you file the tax return. And then next, I'm gonna pass to my co colleague, James, and then he's gonna talk about self-employment obligations. Thank you. Thank you so much. So some self-employment obligations. Unfortunately, if you're making anything more than $400 in a year, that being earnings exceeding expenses, you're required to report this on your taxes. These self-employment taxes are taxes which would have been pulled from your paycheck by your employer if you were working for someone else. These taxes are used to fund Medicare and Social Security. Uh, next slide, please. So making money off of a business versus a hobby. Look, any money made while pursuing a hobby or managing a business should be reported on your taxes, but only expenses related to one's business can be counted as a deductible. If it's unclear whether an activity is a business or a hobby, the IRS has some tests to make their own determination. Generally, the standard is if a person pursues something because they enjoy it and they don't intend to make a profit, the IRS will view it as a hobby. If they do so with the intent of making a profit, the IRS is probably going to look at it as a business. Next slide, please. So what's the difference between an employee or a contractor? How do you know which one you are? An employee is generally anyone who considers it's generally considered anyone who performs a service in a manner specifically dictated by their employer, while an independent contractor is typically a person in an independent trade, business, profession, in which they offer their services to the public. Next slide, please. So if you're a contractor, you're gonna be receiving a 1099 NEC at the end of the year. You're generally gonna have more freedom on how to perform a job, and the relationship you're gonna have with someone paying you is mainly gonna be through contracts. On the under, other hand, if you're an employee, you'll be receiving a W-2 at the end of the year, you're gonna have less freedom in deciding on how your job is performed, and you're also very likely gonna be receiving some kind of employee benefits. Next slide, please. So let's move on to the IRS Bill of Taxpayer Rights. So what the call, what the IRS calls its Bill of Rights be better understood as a set of principles or guidelines that the IRS tries to hold itself to. I'm going to be going over each of these rights and try to give an example of a policy which can be seen as an expression of these rights. So next slide, please. Look, this is the right to be informed. You have a right to know what's going on when you're dealing with the IRS. Uh, imagine the IRS proposes to assess the tax against you. And the first letter they send to you announcing they want some of your money, they're going to have to include information on how the process works and what options you have at your disposal. So whenever the IRS sends you something, it's almost always going to have options for what to do if you agree with the IRS's position, as well as options for what to do if you disagree with the IRS's position. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the right to quality service. You have a right to be treated well. Uh, in the event that you're treated disrespectfully or you're unsatisfied with the handling of your case, you absolutely have the right to complain to a supervisor. Now, whether or not this will be helpful or really change things materially will be dependent on the agent you're in contact with, unfortunately. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the right to pay no more than the correct amount of tax. Uh, this principle is reflected in many of the options that a taxpayer has uh, when they believe they're being taxed more than is legally required. As will soon be discussed, you'll have more than one avenue to fight for the correct amount of tax. Next slide, please. So next we have the right to challenge the IRS's position and be heard. This right generally refers to the principle that the IRS is required to, at the very least, listen to your input when collecting taxes. 
they don't necessarily have to agree, but they do have to give you time to address those challenges. Uh, for example, the IRS wants to levy your bank account or other property, i.e. take some or all of it. You'll generally have an opportunity to request a hearing before the independent, the IRS's independent office of appeals. Next slide, please. You also have the right to appeal an IRS decision in an independent forum. So just as every person has a right to appeal a court decision, you have the right to do so about an IRS's the IRS's decision concerning your tax. By law, the commissioner, the head of the IRS, must ensure that there's an independent IRS Office of Appeals. Uh, it's gonna be the location where you try and further challenge IRS decisions. Next slide, please. You also have a right to finality. So this right is really a statement for the fact that the IRS only has a window of time uh, to collect taxes. It can be expressed in policies like, the IRS has three years from the date you file your tax return to assess any additional taxes for that year. The IRS has 10 years from the assessment date to collect unpaid taxes from you. Uh, if the IRS sends you a notice proposing additional taxes, the notice must include a deadline for when you can file a petition to change the amount proposed. So there, there's time frames for all of these things. Uh, next, we have the right to confidential to privacy. Thank you. Uh, this right attests to the IRS's general desire not to snoop around your finances more than it needs to. Um, but it also should be noted that this will be to the government standards and not necessarily your own. Uh, in what are called due, uh, collection due process hearings, the Independent Office of Appeals, as mentioned before, must consider whether the IRS's proposed collection actually balances their need for efficient tax collection and the general desire to respect taxpayers' money. Next slide, please. So you also have a right to confidentiality. So the IRS isn't allowed to give your information to third parties without your consent or some other law allowing them to do so. Additionally, the IRS can't contact third parties such as your employer, your neighbors, or your bank to get information to adjust or collect your taxes that you owe, unless they give you a reasonable notice in advance. It should be noted, notice not acceptance. They just need to let you know that they're going to do that. Next slide, please. So you also have the right to retain representation. You know, as is often the case when dealing with government officials, you have a right to qualified representation. It could be a lawyer, could be a CPA, could be an enroll agent. In most situations, the IRS must suspend an interview if you request to consult a representative, as mentioned above. But if you can't afford such representation, there are low-income taxpayer clinics like uh, Brooklyn Legal Corporation A to assist you. And that last slide, is the right to a fair and just tax system. So this is a very guideline-y type of right, but it attests to the general desire of the IRS to be fair in its action. But as was said earlier, it's important to remember that what the IRS considers to be fair and just, will unfortunately not necessarily align with your own definition. Just something to keep in mind. Furthermore, might be fine, Further information on these rights can be found on the IRS's website as their Taxpayer Bill of Rights. Now, with all that said and done, the next thing to do is to pass it to my friend, Evan Spalder. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and thank you, James. Next part of this uh, workshop that we'll be working through is our tax collections. So this is gonna be covering what happens when you receive a letter from the IRS or the New York State Tax Department saying that you owe money and what your options are available going through. And this is just a breakdown of those options. Um, once you receive that letter, you'll have the option to do a single payment an installment agreement or an offer and compromise. And at the end, we'll discuss the differences between, very briefly discuss the differences between the New York State offer and the IRS's offer and compromise. So first, what is a collection letter look like and why have you received one? Uh, generally, people will receive a collections letter due to some unpaid tax amount from a previous tax year, some amount was not owed, paid in full, or a credit was claimed incorrectly that maybe shouldn't have been claimed. Uh, and so the IRS will send, or New York State will send a letter to the taxpayer 
dis, uh, disclosing what they owe and when the payment date is required. Once you receive that letter, you have three options to resolve the liability. Your first option is the simplest, which is just paying it outright in full, the full amount that it asks for. You go online or go to the phone number uh, listed in the letter and pay it all directly. Second option is to do a monthly installment agreement, sometimes referred to as a payment plan, to break it up over monthly installments. And lastly, you can apply for an offer in compromise. And we'll be discussing each of these uh, in a bit of detail. So the first option is to do the single payment referred to as a pay now. You can use a direct deposit, or I'm sorry, um, a direct link from a bank account where you use your routing number and you can pay it directly online. You can also use a debit card, credit card, or digital wallet in order to make that payment. Uh, this is often uh, the simplest and easiest option. However, if you can't afford to make the payment all in one uh, single payment, then it may be better to move on to our other two options that we move into starting with the installment agreement. If it's easier to break it up into monthly payments to pay the liability over several months, then this may be a solid uh, opportunity to uh, still meet your IRS or New York State liabilities without having uh, over encumbrances on your bank accounts or getting into uh, you know, independent financial issues. Um, this is sometimes referred to as a payment plan and it allows you to break up that payment over a month or over a longer period of time. Something to keep note of is that the IRS and New York State will both charge interest on the liability as the plan is extended. So for each month that the uh, liability is not paid in full, there is a small interest that will incur. The interest fees are fairly low, but that is something to keep in mind as you choose which plan is best for you. This is recommended, again, for people who are unable to pay the full liability in a single payment, but could afford doing it or making those payments over a longer period of time. So those payment options will be in the short term and the long term. Short term plan is anything that is 180 days or six months or less. And that doesn't cost anything to set up the plan. It's free application. But again, something to note of is the longer you stretch the plan, the higher the um, total payment will, or total amount owed will be because of the interest. Uh, the second option then is that long-term plan where it is greater than 180 days or greater than six months. Um, you have an option to do either automatic withdrawals from your bank account, which will have a $31 setup fee. If you do qualify as a low income taxpayer, then you can have that setup fee waived down to $0. So it's a totally free application similar to the short-term application. And if you don't want to do automatic withdrawals from the account, you can set it up to do uh, manual payments where you make the payments each month on whatever date agreed. That does have a higher startup fee of $130. And if you do qualify for the low-income uh, taxpayer status, then you can have that fee reduced from 130 down to $43, but there still would be a fee associated with the application. This is the chart that they use to determine your low app, their low income taxpayer status. So you can be anywhere within this, depending on your family size. If you do qualify for this, they will look at, or to qualify for this, excuse me, they will look at, or the IRS or New York State will look at your monthly gross income multiplied by 12 to represent the year, and then look at one of these columns to determine based on your family size, whether you meet the qualifications for low income status. Again, when deciding how long you want to set your payment plan, it's best to consider what your, your own personal finances look like and what you can afford each month to put towards these payments, considering things like your food, your rent, clothing, transportation costs, um, you know, your monthly income after taxes. These are all important things to keep in mind when deciding how long and what you'd like or how long the plan should be and what you'd like your monthly payments to look like. Something, again, we must keep in mind that you can go up to 72 months, so you can set the plan for quite a long period of time. However, again, each month of the liability is unpaid. There is still an accumulation of interest against the plan or against the principal balance. So something to keep in mind that if you go with that shorter plan, the monthly payments will be higher, but the principal amount will stay lower. Whereas if you go with a longer plan, the monthly payments will be lower but the principal will increase because of the, the compounding interest. 
if you do qualify for the low income status, you can fill out form 13844 in order to get the low income taxpayer certification to waive those fees for the application. And these are the resources you can use in order to apply for the um, installment agreement, either through the IRS's website or through their phone call. And the New York State has similar resources as well. The last method to uh, address your collections from the IRS in New York State is by filing an offer and compromise. This is pretty straightforward, even though it's the one we're probably most or least familiar with. It's pretty straightforward to its name. It is an offer to pay the IRS in the New York State less than the amount owed by the taxpayer. And it's pretty much as simple as that. It may be a legitimate option for you as a taxpayer. If you do not have enough in assets to uh, pay the total amount that you owe in liabilities, if you have met some exceptional circumstance that would uh, mean requiring full payment from either the IRS or New York State, would cause some economic hardship to you, or some special circumstance has occurred, such as serious illness, that would prevent you from being able to pay the liabilities without impairing your ability to provide for basic necessities for yourself and your family. In order to qualify for, or in order to meet the requirements for an OIC offer and compromise, the taxpayer must have filed all tax returns for previous years required of them, they must also uh, have received a New York state or IRS tax bill for at least one tax debt. They must make all estimated tax payments for the current tax year. And lastly, they must not be in active bankruptcy proceedings. If someone is in active bankruptcy proceedings and looking to file an offer in compromise, they can still do so once the proceedings have concluded. When the IRS and New York state receive an offer in compromise, they will consider the taxpayer's monthly income, their monthly expenses, and their equity and assets. So monthly income is going to include your earned income from W-2s, which is a regular employment job, social security income, and any other form of revenue such as rental income or anything similar. Uh, monthly expenses will include food, transportation, clothing. This is a very customizable category to the individual taxpayer's needs and the, in, uh, the expenses will depend on the individual. The IRS does have a list of standardized expenses. However, uh, if the individual taxpayer's expenses are greater than the IRS's standards, then the IRS and the New York State will use the individual taxpayer's uh, monthly expenses rather than using the standard expenses. If the opposite is the case, where the individual has expenses that are lower than the IRS's standards, then they will go with the standards amount for determining a person's monthly expenses. And the last thing that they'll look at is equity and assets, which will include uh, owned property, such as homes, cars, vehicles, as well as bank accounts and other accounts with financial institutions. When filing an offer compromise, uh, it's important to note that the offer that you are making for reducing your liabilities cannot, the offer cannot be zero dollars. It can be any amount greater than zero dollars, such as one dollar, but the number just cannot be zero dollars. You are offering to reduce the amount from whatever it is owed to as low as one or whatever is reasonable based on that individual taxpayer's uh, available funds. When you decide or when you are able and ready to file, you will look at, to fill out forms 433A if you are an individual or 433B if you are filing as a business. And additionally, you will have to fill out form 656. Those are just the two, or those are the only two forms for the IRS's OIC. They will require some additional documents. It is important to keep in mind that the IRS is a government agency as well as New York State, and it is important to comply with their minimum requirements for documents and to make sure that you are submitting the documents that they are asking for. These are a list of all the applicant or the documents that each will ask for. So for all applicants, you must submit pay stubs, which again will come from your W-2 jobs or a social security letter, whatever shows the consistent income. Then they will also request uh, the most recent statement from investment or retirement count, if that is applicable to you. Uh, they will request your most recent statements from any other forms of income, again, social security, anything from rental income, 
or court-ordered income such as child support, alimony, or rent subsidies would also then be included as one of the documents you submit with your offer and compromise. Additionally, they will request your three most recent bank statements and including, or I'm sorry, you will also include the IRS and New York State uh, collections letter that you have received showing the total amount owed in liabilities. If these are also applicable to you, then they will also be included. Things like a loan statement from your lender for a home or auto loan, uh, a list of notes receivable. If you are filing with a CPA or an attorney, then you will also include Form 2848, which grants those individuals an attorney or CPA power of attorney to assist in filing and submitting the documents on your behalf. And lastly, if you are filing, earlier we mentioned the statuses of uh, why you would file an offering compromise. If you have a special circumstance or exceptional circumstance, then you would also include here evidence of that circumstance. Last thing that we will begin to cover, or cover here for the offering compromise is the cost of the offering compromise itself. Submitting the application does cost $205 to be submitted with the application. And then separately, of course, is the actual offer that you are uh, proposing to reduce the liabilities from either the IRS or New York State. So you would include that into your application. However, if you do qualify as a low-income taxpayer via the low-income taxpayer certification, then you do not have to include the offer amount in that actual letter that you submit with the offer and compromise. Just general notes to submit or when submitting an offer and compromise is that when you do submit it, the IRS, there is not a guarantee that the IRS will accept it. And it does take up to 24 months to hear back from the IRS in New York State as to an approval or rejection of the status of the letter. We mentioned this earlier, but New York State does have slightly different requirements for their offer and compromises. Um, there is a separate form that you would fill out for New York State, separate from the IRS's forms. Uh, the state will require 20 DTF4, excuse me, and they would also require only three documents listed here, which is your three most recent federal tax or federal income tax returns, excuse me. They will also require a credit report from within the last 30 days. And lastly, 12 months of bank statements. And now I'll pass it back over to our program director, uh, Tamara LeCamry. Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for joining. At this time, we are going to open it up for any type of questions. Yeah, so thank you, Tamara. Uh, just to remind people, so if you'd like to ask your question verbally, you can uh, raise your hand uh, with the little button at the bottom of your screen, uh, and then we will unmute you so you can uh, ask your question directly to the group. Um, and uh, if you prefer, you can type your question into the Q&A chat uh, function, which you should see at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and maybe just to start, a um, uh, question from earlier. We talked about uh, self-employment obligations. You guys want to talk a little bit about upcoming deadlines uh, and things to um, uh, keep in mind if you're self-employed as opposed to just April tax day for most people. And before that, also, I will put into the chat for everybody our uh, contact info or both our phone number and email. So if you ever need to reach us for services, uh, those are the best ways to contact us. We have, is it, James, are you, did you cover the self-employment in your section? Yes, I did. Oh, cool. Yeah, I want to just remind people that there's other deadlines uh, throughout the year if you're self-employed. I, oh, I might unfortunately, I, I didn't I go can that take deep this into Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so when you're self-employed, you have to pay quarterly taxes or estimated taxes based upon the amount that you had earned for the uh, previous period. So for example, the next quarter that we are entering is going into the third quarter. 
So that time period would cover June 1st to August 31st and estimated taxes would be due by September 15th, 2023. And then we have another quarter, which would be the fourth quarter, which would cover the period September 1st to December 31st, 2023. The self-employment estimated taxes would be due by January 16th, 2024. Excellent. Thank you so much, Tara. Other folks have questions? Give it a little time here. Uh, like I said, if you'd like to ask uh, your question over the, uh, or verbally, you can use the raise your hand function. Uh, if you click on the three buttons at the bottom of your screen, it says more, uh, then you'll see raise hand as an option. Otherwise, you'll see the little Q&A uh, bubbles at the bottom, and you can ask a question there. And if you don't have any questions now, we also offer tax talk where you can schedule a one-on-one -on -one meeting with one of our attorneys and specifically discuss your personal income tax problem in confidence. Yeah, great plug, Mara. We, yeah, those are um, running every two weeks. Uh, if you are curious about the dates, we have them posted on basically all of our uh, social media platforms. Uh, I'm not sure, I don't think I can share a image into our chat here, but uh, if you visit um, the Brooklyn A uh, Instagram or our Twitter or Facebook page, we, we post it regularly. You'll see that uh, the dates um, and I, well, you know what, actually I can post the sign up link that I can do. Give me two seconds, I'll grab that. And again, feel free if you do have questions type or uh, raise your hand. Okay. This is the bit.ly link that will uh, direct you to sign up. And when you go, you'll see there's a drop down menu um, for all of the upcoming dates. And so you can just pick the one that works for you. It's an open office hours uh, from four to six every other Thursday. So you can jump in. Uh, we'll have a, a Brooklyn expert on the call uh, throughout that time. And you can uh, just jump in at whenever works best for you and uh, and talk one-on-one, -on -one, deal with your, your specific uh, tax questions, as Tamara said. All right. I'm not seeing hands raised. So uh, we might, uh, might not have more questions. Uh, but I will say, so we uh, post all of our um, webinars like this on uh, our YouTube channel, and we uh, share them on all of our other channels uh, on social. We'll send it out uh, in an email to everyone who joined tonight. Um, you can, of course, if you have uh, specific follow-ups about your own personal tax situation, whatever it may be, please do call us again our, uh, uh, or contact us. You can uh, call or email. Um, the number is 718-487-2300. And the best email for us is info at bka.org. Those are in the chat here. Uh, and then, we, like I said, we'll uh, we'll be sharing all of this info uh, and the the full video of tonight's program um, over our uh, YouTube channel, and we'll email that out to you directly with the link. So, unless there's any last call for any questions, if anyone has one. Otherwise, we'll say thank you so much again uh, to our three interns who did an excellent job. Uh, and thank you again to our sponsors, uh, Senator Roxanne Prasad and Council Member uh, Marjorie Velasquez. We really appreciate um, uh, uh, everyone being here tonight and hope everybody's staying cool in these uh, hot July days. And thank you again. <laughs>